On the north slope of Alaska, winter is at least 10 months long. Summer? If you blinked your eyes, you'd miss it. This is tundra, 12 inches of plant matter struggling for survival atop 1,500 feet of frozen gravel, mud, and ice. If the tundra's delicate life balance is disturbed, plants and animals might well disappear from the region. And for the caribou and other Arctic creatures, this must be conserved. And so a revegetation experiment has been undertaken. Grass seed and fertilizer are flown in by helicopter, as during the summer, trucks might destroy the fragile tundra soil. The seeding is done the old-fashioned way, by hand, acre after acre. An airborne spreader distributes the fertilizer. And what of the results of this experiment? Nature's verdict is not yet in, but the hope is that if these new grasses can survive the cold of the Arctic winter, then increasing numbers of caribou and reindeer will run wild and free, and more and more flowers will shed their beauty on this otherwise barren land. Strategically located in the heart of Southeast Asia, the landlocked kingdom of Laos is slightly larger than Idaho. It is a primitive land. Barely 15% of its 3 million people can read or write, and many Laotians in remote regions still believe the world is flat. Life is hard and short, with an expectancy of but 30 to 40 years. Women work and weave, live and labor in huts and hamlets where time has seemingly stood still for decades, generations, centuries. Struggling for existence and survival, the average Laotian's per capita income is less than $70 a year. Only the cities reflect the events and influence of the 20th century, and even here, much of the past is retained and remembered. Thrust into the turmoil that has gripped Southeast Asia for 25 years, the Kingdom of Laos has passed from colonialism to independence to civil war. A devoutly religious people, they follow Buddha's five commandments against murder, theft, falsehood, adultery, and alcoholism. The country is a constitutional monarchy with a king, Savang Vatana, whose powers are largely ceremonial. Limited independence came to Laos in 1949, after 56 years as a French protectorate and a brief occupation by Japanese forces in World War II. The country was granted sovereign status in a French Union of Indochina states. With the end of the Indochina War in 1954, Laos was given complete independence. A year later, she was admitted to the United Nations. The Laotian government sets up a royal capital at Luang Prabang and an administrative capital at Vientiane. But with independence comes conflict, nurtured in the mountainous northwest provinces of the strategic kingdom. Under Prince of Anufong, a communist movement is formed to challenge the government in Vientiane. The rebels call themselves the Passat Lao meaning land of Laos, and they are supported and supplied by communist sympathizers in North Vietnam. There are, through the infant years of Laotian independence, attempts to integrate the Passat Lao into the central government and its armed forces. But the efforts fail, and the communists continue their war of insurgency. Strengthened from within and without, the path at Lao stream into, through, and out of the jungles that provide them sanctuary. Sweeping out of the provinces that border on China and North Vietnam, the rebels are better trained, armed, and disciplined. Government forces suffer routs and retreats, withdrawal and defeat, as the path at Lao forces extend their grip on the country spreading out of the northern provinces to sweep south and west toward the strategic plain of Jars. 
By the spring of 1961, the rebel forces appeared to be in a position to take over the entire country. This map illustrates the expansion of the Pass at Lao in the seven years following the end of the war in Indochina. Tens of thousands of refugees are caught up in the spreading conflict, uprooted from their ancestral homes with only the worldly goods they can carry on their backs. As the crisis worsens, an American president makes a fateful statement on Laos. In Washington, John F. Kennedy emphasizes the free world stake in the continuing independence of the imperiled nation. He asserts, the security of all Southeast Asia will be endangered if Laos loses its neutral independence. Its own safety runs with the safety of us all, in real neutrality observed by all. I want to make it clear to the American people and to all the world that all we want in Laos is peace, not war. A truly neutral government, not a Cold War pawn. A settlement concluded at the conference table and not on the battlefield. Our response will be made in close cooperation with our allies and the wishes of the Laotian government. We will not be provoked, trapped, or drawn into this or any other situation. But I know that every American will want his country to honor its obligations to the point that freedom and security of the free world and ourselves may be achieved. President Kennedy's words are transformed into increased economic and military aid for Laos. More than $50 million a year in arms and equipment are flown into the country. American military advisors are provided to train and instruct the Royal Laotian troops in the use of U.S. military equipment. But no American combat troops are sent into the country. At the same time, a 14-nation conference on Laos is held in Geneva in 1961. After more than a year of difficult negotiations, agreements are signed in July 1962, providing international guarantees for the independent and neutral status of Laos. Secretary of State Rusk signs the Treaty for America, and Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko initials the historic pact for the Soviet Union. Within Laos, the three principal political leaders meet to form a coalition government. Prince of Anafong leads the communist path at Laos faction. His older half-brother, Prince of Anafuma, represents the neutralist forces. And completing the triumvirate is Prince Bumum, a former premier and spokesman for the conservatives. The men meet in seeming harmony for several hours and announce the formation of a government of national union with representation for all Laotian political parties. In the search for peace and stability in Laos, Bumum, the rightist, and Sivano Fong, the leftist, agree to participate in a parliament headed by the neutralist, Prince Sivano Fuma. But within a year, the agreement breaks down. Savannah Fuma continues as premier, but the Pass at Lao representatives withdraw from the coalition government in Vientiane. The civil war resumes, and once again, forces loyal to the central government and King Patana are severely tested by the communist armies of the Pass at Lao. America continues her military and economic assistance. In addition, U.S. planes bomb the Ho Chi Minh Trail that runs through Laos and is used by North Vietnam as a supply and infiltration route into South Vietnam. Years pass and the civil war goes on. The country is divided politically between the communist-supported Path at Lao and the western-supported neutralist rightist coalition. The communists control the eastern half of the country, including the vitally important Ho Chi Minh Trail. The government rules the nation's western half with most of the rice land and the city. 
Early in 1970, the Pathet Lao forces mount a new attack on the plain of Jars and overrun the strategic gateway to the country's major roadways. Casualties are heavy as the government forces once again are put to rout. The crisis raises new concerns over America's commitment to the defense of Laos as a neutral nation. Government leaders report a continuing buildup of North Vietnamese troops in Laos. By spring of 1970, the figure is said to have reached 67,000. Without aid from the free world, Laos cannot continue to survive as a neutral and independent nation. Already 600,000 Laotians, more than one-fifth of the population, have been forced to leave their hamlets and homes. Other thousands have laid down their lives. In an official statement spelling out American policy on Laos, President Nixon confirms that the United States has stepped up its combat air support in Laos and increased its military assistance to the government of Premier Savannah Fuma. But the president emphasizes America has no plans for introducing ground combat forces into Laos. At the same time, he appeals to Russia and Great Britain to initiate diplomatic moves to end the war. Prince Ivan Othong responds with a proposal that peace talks begin after the United States has halted its bombing raids on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Pathet Lao leader warns of continuing civil war until this pre-conference condition is met. And to underscore his words, the communists step up their offensive. In Vientiane, Premier Savannah Fuma rejects the terms laid down by his half-brother. But even as he speaks, the Pathet Lao forces overrun and capture a city only 90 miles from the administrative capital. Pledging an all-out fight to defend and preserve his country's independence and neutrality, Savano Fuma orders reinforcements into battle, and within a week, the city is recaptured. But the fighting has taken its toll on the city, just as the civil war has taken its toll on the country. A battle has been won, but other battles remain. And always there is the concern as to how far the supporters of the path at Lao will go to advance their cause, and how firmly the allies of Laos will respond to ensure its existence as a free and neutral country. Thus, on jungle trails and in lonely frontier villages, the search for peace goes on, a search that has proved so difficult so elusive, so heartbreaking in Laos and in all of Southeast Asia. Presented in cooperation with your school authorities by Atlantic.